morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to open up this course. So this is um, the third or depending how we count the fourth time a course like that is being offered. And um, of course every time it changes a bit, but you should be the beneficiaries of quite some iteration already. So I think it's actually a really outstanding course. I'd like to start out by acknowledging and thanking those who actually made it happen. So this is mostly Edward who just uh, opened the meeting. He really did all the connections with Embo who support financially this, um, this course. It's the first time that Embo supports it and I think it's important to acknowledge that Embo actually um, does support this course because I, I think it's a it's a nice gesture from them and it's an important way to disseminate this um, targeting proteomics uh, techniques. And then Edward was um, an e Eva and Christina at the locally did the organization of this course. Would also like to thank all the outside instructors. You will you see them on the on the website and of course you will encounter you will encounter them in person. And it is really a terrific team, which works very well together, as you will see, and comes, comes into this course with a lot of dedication and uh, a lot of creative ideas. So, the, so here are a few goals that um, I think we'd like to achieve with this course. So we'd like to achieve that at the end of the week, course participants will be able to explain what type of projects benefit from targeted proteomics and why. It is not necessarily so that targeted proteomics is a tool that is suitable for every, um, every question. It is a, a, a terrific tool, uh, it's a terrific technique, but not every question is addressable by it. So it would be great if at the end you could differentiate where pro targeted proteomics, where maybe some other technique would be suitable. We ho hope you would be able to explain the strengths of weaknesses of targeted proteomics. This again goes into uh, recording or reporting or acknowledging the, um, the right technique for the right um, experimental design. We would hope that you would be explain, able to explain the um, different implementations of targeted proteomics technology. There used to be basically one selected or multiple reaction monitoring. Now there's been an explosion of techniques and they all have their strengths and also to some extent of course weaknesses. And then I hope, we hope that you would be able to design an optimal targeted experiment, carry it out in the, in the laboratory and then be proficient in the data analysis generated. This is a very important point and in fact initially the course was designed just to focus on data analysis and then Embo turned it down. They said well it's no point of teaching data analysis if, uh, if we don't uh, if the students don't know how to generate the data. So the course this time is slightly changed to, to be a bit broader, but I still think, and uh, I think also the other course instructors would, would agree, that the data analysis is probably a, in, in every form of proteomics or large-scale biology currently the bottleneck. So a lot of emphasis is, is based on, on here that what the data that come out are actually credible and truly um, true positives as a whole as a as opposed to an accumulation of, of uh, false, false positive results. Okay, so here's an outline of what, I'm what I'm trying to cover in the next um, um, 50 minutes or so. I'd like, I'd like to make some comments about the general proteomics landscape, comment about the uptake of proteomics, whether the impact proteomics has had and why it has had not necessarily a bigger impact. Place the targeting MS in the proteomics landscape and then I'll show two applications or two kind of typical uh, studies. One that is in the domain of conventional research where we where probably a, a conventional research strategy was used to derive new biological knowledge. And then I'll, I'll make some comments about how we can use targeted proteomics to support new direct research strategies. And then a couple of very brief comments about the future. Okay. So let's get started here. Um, this is a, a very old a picture um, or graph that comes out from, 19, from the 1990s, 1998, 
is a little review we wrote with Paul Haynes, Steve Kiki, and Dan, Dan Figge. And at the time, proteomics was still very young. So this was basically the definition of proteomics, which was coined by Mark Wilkins in Australia. And proteomics was defined as the global referable quantitative analysis of the proteins expressed in a cell at a particular time. There's actually some debate about, about the, the, the definition, but basically we try to assess, quantify, and identify all proteins in the cell. It became fairly clear immediately that we're talking about very different things. While, of course, we like to measure a lot of proteins, you can do this with a different mindset. And at the time we, we, we described here in this little um, review, basically two branches or two domains of proteomics. The one would be to, is basically the equivalent of a genome project where, this, where the community went out and said, we want to identify completely the human genome or the genome of another species. And so the analogous situation here would, would, like, would be to enumerate all the, pro all the protein components of a proteome. So, uh, so we call this a proteome as a database, basically as a reference map. And the implication would be that the proteome would have to be analyzed once, and would build such a map, a reference map, and then one would be done. And this reference map would have various utilities. And there's the other branch or domain where we would like to detect dynamic changes in the proteome follow following some, some changes, for instance, in disease or pharmacological perturbations or whatever the case. So here we would use basically the proteome as a biological, proteome measurements as a biological or clinical assay. And the implication would be that the proteome would need to be analyzed multiple, maybe infinite number of times. You need to do repeat analysis to analyze the proteome over and over again, preferably precisely and reproducibly. And I think um, this distinction has now, has, was for a long time kind of blurred or, or went, went away. And now I think it's coming back again into the foreground because I think it's pretty clear that the techniques that are used to enumerate a protein, basically to generate a map, are not necessarily the same techniques as those that one would use to do reanalysis, multiple analysis. And, and I think we think, and that's probably one of the take-home messages <coughs> of this course, that the techniques for to, to, to do that, basically to use the proteome as a clinical or biological assay to measure differences across many conditions that the targeted mass spectrometry would be a suitable tool to do this, whereas here a different techniques are widely being used. Okay, so let's focus first for a few minutes on this side here. The goal would be to say we have a sample, maybe this sample contains the whole proteome of a, of a, of a species, maybe of, of a differentiated cell, and we would like to analyze this proteome, basically make a complete proteome map of the sample. This is what most um, proteomic laboratories and studies are doing, or have been certainly along, uh, until recently, and this is usually referred to as discovery proteomics. So I think everyone here knows the general workflow. There's many, many variants of the, of the general topic. I'm certainly not going to spend a lot of time on that, but, we, but the, 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 this, the nomer proteomics is actually a misnomer because we never analyze the proteome. We analyze pep a peptidome or peptides that are derived from digesting the protein. So this is a figure again from a fairly old review. Um, and so we take a sample of proteins, we digest it, turn it into peptides, and then these peptides are separated by reverse phase chromatography, sometimes by two or three dimensional chromatography or even gel electrophoresis. So there's many, many variants of techniques here, but ultimately peptides are ionized and infused or injected in a tandem mass spectrometer, which, as you certainly all know, will select the peptide one after time sequentially, generate a, re a fragment ion spectrum, and these fragment ion spectra are then searched against the database to assign a sequence to associate this peptide fragment ion spectrum with a sequence. So the important things here are we're not measuring proteins, and we, that peptide, we measure peptides, and that these peptides then have to be somehow related back to the proteins. So this is widely used, I would say, probably right now, something <coughs> in the range of 90% of all proteomic papers published would use this technique. 
but it is not a perfect technique. <coughs> I mean, it has some underlying difficulties and challenges that come out from how the proteome is built and how the proteome is digested at a product when a proteome is digested. So this is a um, this is a, a, a study, uh, a sm fairly small study, that um, uh, at the time visiting student in our group did this was in the sometimes um, 2006 2007, and this was um, student was Paula Picotti who has now her own laboratory, and I asked her to take highly purified proteins. This is a small protein of about 120 or 140 amino acids digest this protein as you would digest a protein if you want to do shotgun proteomics or discovery proteomics and use what, we, what was at the time our most sensitive mass spectrometer, an FD, FDICR instrument to find how many, to, the, to determine how many peptides you could find from this protein. So this is what she found. So this is a small protein, about 140 or so amino acids and one would expect if one applied in a computer triptych rules uh, how trips and cleaves proteins, one would expect about 20 to 25 peptides. But when she started to identify the, even the small peaks, she identified uh, way uh, beyond 100 um, peptides from this very sim single, highly purified single protein. So then she listed here the um, ion currents that are generated from the precursors of the <coughs> peptides. So here we have abundance in to per percent of total ion current. Uh, the, uh, here we have number of peptides, and then the color code is fully triptych peptides, as one would expect usually by triptych digestion, are shown in, in yellow, and the partially triptych peptides are shown in, um, in red. So what we see here is actually a very, I think, very informative graph, and it changed, as simple as it is, it, it changed our view on the whole field of discovery proteomics. What we see is that there is a few peptides that we would expect from triptych digestion. These are the products we would clearly expect and they are present and they occupy a fairly high fraction of the total line current. So these are high signals, these are the high fly peptides. But then in addition, we have a very long tail here of, of peptides which are not expected. They're partially triptych, some are modified, some have an oxidizing thionine or whatever. And there's many, many of them, hundreds, maybe hundreds now, if we had even a, a better instrument. And, and these peptides are real. So they're, they're not, they're not um, um, one could call them chemical noise, but they're real and they're present. So now what are the implications? So if the implications are that if we analyze a single purified protein, it has no, there's no bearing because we say, okay, we identify these peptides, we know the protein, and that's it. It has, however, imp very sig important significance if we try to analyze 10,000 proteins in a sample. And if these proteins are spread in their abundance over five, six, seven, or eight orders of magnitude, and each one of these proteins generates a long tail of these peptides, because that means we generate an enormous number of peptides, which are very difficult to deal with in the, in the shotgun mode, where the mass spectrometer tries to sample from this large pool of peptides. So we concluded at the time, based on large of these results, that we would probably change um, the landscape a bit and try to do something else than just brute force sequencing through these uh, peptide, um, peptide complex samples. So this is a, uh, sorry for the colors, uh, but I now want to point out two implications of this, of this background of very large numbers of peptides that are being generated if we digest a, um, a proteome. The first implication is that we identify in the discovery mode peptides somewhat randomly out of this large pool. And then we identify these peptides and we have to re-infer which, pro which protein was represented by these identified peptides. So this is a, a basically what we're doing in this discovery mode. If we take a protein sample consisting of proteins A, B, C, and D, of course many, many more, maybe up to 10 or, or more thousand, they are digested and this generates a complex peptide mixture. This peptide mixture is then usually separated and then the mass spectrometer generates fragment ion spectra uh, 
that we um, that we can then analyze using the well um, the well known database search engines. So that part here, we are on very solid ground because I think right now the search engines and tools to inf to determine which one of these identifications of a peptide when this fragment ion spectrum is assigned to a peptide sequence here um, and, and how correct is this association. Is this, they're in very good shape. These are really terrific tools and they're very mature. So, but then we end up with a situation that we have a number of peptides identified here, presumably correctly, and then we need to predict which proteins are represented by these peptides. And this is what's referred to as protein inference problem where we try to associate peptides with the proteins that were initially in the sample. And this still to this day remains a difficult challenge because there is really no concrete solution. There is no fi finite solution or no definitive solution. You may have a case like this peptide here which associates only with one protein and then the association is clear. We can say if we see this peptide, we, we have identified this protein. If this peptide does not occur again over the whole protein, so we call these peptides prototypic peptides, and they're useful peptides, but of course when we, when we do a random sampling of the peptide pool, we don't know a priori whether a peptide is prototypic or not. This is actually one of the, of the big advantages of the targeted analysis, that we can select a priori which peptides have the most definitive information content, so we can focus on these prototypic peptides. But in discovery proteomics, we can't. And then we have peptides like this one here, for instance, which occurs in this protein here, but it also, or this peptide here, it occurs in this protein, but exactly the same peptide occurs in that protein here. So it's difficult to infer which proteins are present from the peptides which are presumably correctly identified. So one of the implications from this large pool of peptides generated, and the fact that we don't really have control over which peptides we sequence is, that these, that these protein inferences are made on certain assumptions, and these assumptions may be correct or not correct. There's many possible solutions. None is probably the right solution. I think there's no one in the world who could step, stand up and say, I have identified um, 20,000 peptides with a false discovery rate of 0.1%, and conclusively say that these peptides represent a certain set of proteins with high confidence. This is always based on a model. This, is, this inference is always based on a model which has certain assumptions. So this is one of the implications of, or, or limitations of this identification workflow. And of course, we can alleviate that to a large extent by targeting if we focus on peptides which do not occur multiple times over the protein, over the proteome. Another implication is that if we sequence uh, if we sequence peptides out of this window here, which is retention time versus mass, each dot represents a precursor peptide that is detected by the mass spectrometer of a complex sample. We will see that even with, with, with very fast scanning instruments as we have them today, a sizable fraction of the precursors is actually not touched by the mass spectrometer. So this is a direct implication of this large proteolytic background, that there is a very large number of peptides being generated, that there is a larger number of peptides present in a sample, that even the fastest scanning mass spectrometer can, can select and fragment. So this leads, if you do this once, this is okay. If you do this a hundred times over, it is unlikely that the mass spectrometer will be always sequence the same peptide, so it has an inherent irreproducibility of data, <coughs> of data acquisition if one is doing analyzing substantially similar samples using the discovery approach, it's a direct consequence. Nothing wrong with the machine, it's nothing wrong with the operator, it's simply a, a consequence of the fact that there's many more peptides present in the sample than the mass spectrometer can handle. So, um, this is a graph that I, sh uh, that I copied out of a review that was published in 11. 2010, <coughs> and it where we try to summarize some some effects of this discovery proteomic field, and I just want and here one of the notable curves or notable features is all the others will ignore that here we plot the number of proteins 
that were claimed to be identified in proteomic papers in the time frame of 99 <coughs> to 2010. So we, this is a logarithmic scale here, so there's actually a big difference. We see that in the, uh, like, around 2000, the number of proteins was in the range claimed, identified was in the range of 100 or so, maybe a couple of hundred. This was the state of the art then. I mean, you, today one might say, well, this is backwards. And then was this explosion, I mean, up to almost, um, to almost, uh, well, certainly way below, below, but to several thousand, and then it decreased. And then it sl slowly crept up again. So this, I show this slide because I want to make one very specific point. I mean, I think what happened here is the introduction. So here is a, a certain degree of exuberance. People got excited and run a lot of samples through the mass spectrometer and they identified with tensity very large numbers of proteins. And we, we think now that many of that this peak basically is, a, is one gigantic artifact. Maybe not completely, but to a large extent, because no one had any idea how to distinguish true assignments of peptides to and distinguish them from false assignments of peptides to their corresponding sequences. So every, everyone at this time could make up their own rules and could say, I run a search engine and have some kind of threshold of scoring. And of course, the, if you lower the threshold of scoring, the number of identification goes up. And since no reviewer nor a reader of a journal could actually, uh, had actually a true, a, a true gold standard or reference point, um, every, anything went. So I think this led to this explosion, and over the, oh, in the time here, there were statistical models introduced that actually tried to say which assignments <coughs> of, a, of a spectrum are true, as opposed to which assignments of spectrum to a peptide sequence are wrong. And this led to a decrease, or seeming decrease, of identified proteins. So it's not that the proteomics community got, um, got lazy or, or less competent, in fact, it got more sophisticated because la false positive identifications to a large extent were eliminated from the literature. So, um, and then, of course, in the, over the last few years, the numbers here have gone up, mostly due to, and really truly gone up, because now better instruments, better techniques, search engines and so on became available. So I'm showing this slide to, uh, to highlight the importance of software tools. Because exactly as one would do here in shotgun proteomics, one could conceivably um, <coughs> generate some tool or some judgment case for targeted proteomics and say, even a tiny, tiny little blip that someone might imagine from a data set is a true assignment of a peptide, and, and one might generate very, a large number of false positive identifications. So one of the highlights or one of the fo foci of this course is to really spend time on trying to avoid such a gigantic artifact problem in targeting proteomics by having right from the beginning, now this time around, um, very good tools which you will learn how to use that avoids largely, not completely of course, but largely false positives. Okay, so now um, we can clearly say these days in discovery proteomics we are on pretty solid ground we can identify proteins quite reliably. And you may have seen two papers come out uh, early this year, a few months ago, one from Akhilesh Pandey's laboratory, one from Bernard Kuster's laboratory, where they claim to have basically mapped out the human protein. So this is kind of the culmination of the left side of the graph that I showed at the beginning. There's also other public uh, repositories which have Maybe not quite the same coverage, but very similar coverage is Peptide Atlas, GPM from Ron Beavis, um, then a, pro a, a Proteome project from Hupo. And they all come up with roughly in the range of 14 to 18,000 proteins identified credibly, or to some extent credibly, by mass spectrometric measurements. And so we can say probably that um, the left hand side of this graph that I showed the enumeration generating a map of a proteome is reasonably well under control, even though there is now a huge debate what the false discovery rate of these pep of these two journal of these two journal articles is, whether they actually did recover more or discover more proteins than the that this public publicly supported databases or not. 
and whether additional <laughs> proteins are all true. Or I mean, there's a lot of debate going on. But generally, I think it, the, we can say that if there is proteins to be discovered in a sample, they probably can be discovered for the most part. So this brings me to the summary. first summary here. Try to show that the shotgun or discovery methods are very widely used and are quite robust by now. Um, mostly, they have been robust from the data generation point of view for a long time, but from the data analysis point of view, not such a long time, and this led to this, this blip in the identification landscape. A large number of peptides generated from the proteome digest generate some significant problems. <coughs> I, discuss, I discussed very briefly two, protein inference and reproducibility, but it also creates some additional problems with false discovery creep. So if you accumulate large numbers of data sets, which they did in this uh, Aculish Pandy and Bernard Kuster paper, it leads to, for statistical reasons, to creep uh, of seemingly identified proteins, uh, which are wrong, wrongly identified proteins, even if the underlying peptide identifications are quite solid. And then there's issues about quantitative accuracy. So the development of transparent and accessible software tools provided a solid, a solid base for proteomics. And I think in the targeting, when we come to that, this is now very nicely being solved through contributions of many laboratories and, and through the development, mostly through Skyline team, of, of a very nicely accessible uh, framework where everyone can analyze the data in a consistent framework that no one has to buy and that is well supported. So I think the right from the beginning, targeting proteomics is in a much better shape uh, analysis, data analysis wise, than, than shotgun proteomics ever was. And then we can assume that the human protein, proteome is basically mapped out, but there's a big question mark whether it's actually a true statement. Okay, so now I'm going to make some <coughs> comments about the uptake of proteomics. So, so far I described a very generic technique which hundreds, maybe thousands of laboratories are using. And now I'd like to ask, uh, and it is, I discussed that we have been, as a community, making good progress to establish basically a proteome as a, as a database enumerated components. Now the question I, will, what I want to briefly discuss is if we are so good at making such uh, lists of proteins, what impact <coughs> have they had on biological clinical research? In other words, has the uptake of the biological basic science and clinical research communities really, has, have they taken advantage of these capabilities or have they not taken advantage? So this is a graph that um, is coming from a paper from Al Edwards. Um, it's it's um, kind of a commentary which he published in 2000 in, in the lemma. And it is an extremely interesting uh, paper to me because it illustrated some of the problems we need to address, I think, in proteomics. So he tried to estimate the impact genomics and proteomics has had on the general life science landscape. So this is what he did. He, um, he did a meta-analysis of papers. He went to the literature. And he grouped the time into two time periods a decade before the uh, human genome was published and roughly a decade after the human genome was published. So we would assume that through the discovery and publication of the human genome sequence, which basically explains all the proteins that are to be found in a human, uh, human proteome, and basically identifies all the genes, that this would lead to a drastic change in the distribution or the population of proteins and genes that are reported. In, um, in the literature. Because before the genome sequence was known, someone could invoke some kind of factor. Let's say someone had a biological phenomenon, some activity that they could not explain. They could say, well, I postulate a factor X that carries out this activity. This you can no longer do because you have to explain all biological phenomena that you observe, the functional phenomena, basically within the domain or the ensemble of genes that are present in the genome, or for that matter, their interplay. OK, so, so basically, um, Al did a meta-analysis or impact analysis of um, which proteins and genes have been reported in the literature 10 years before the genome, 10 years after the genome sequence is announced. 
So this is the curve. The blue curve is the 10 years below before, and the, and the and the red ones is the 10 years after. So um, this is focused on just kinases uh, for simply reasons of um, simplicity. So there's about 500 kinases here, but one could do the same, and he actually did do the same for the whole proteome or, or genome, which would be roughly then 20,000 uh, entries. But, but the message is exactly the same. So what we see is two things which are highly remarkable, and I think is highly important for field of proteomics. We see that there's very few, or relatively few, kinases, or by implication genes, that are always showing up in the literature, and many that they never show up in the literature. So research basically has focused before the genome, and also after the genome sequence was known, uh, on a relatively small subset of the human proteome, and the human genome. So most, or put it in other words, most scientists who run a uh, typical life science laboratory, they will focus on a small number of proteins or genes, study them in great detail, and the population of genes that are being studied has not really changed a lot. So the, the genome, neither genomics nor proteomics has had a substantial impact on the distribution of population of proteins and genes. That, that are being studied. So it's a typical like 80-20 distribution, about 80% of the efforts are focused on 20% on, 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 on of the genes, and, and a small effort is focused on the re remaining big, uh, big world. Okay, so we can, we can ask, why, has, why is this? Why has genomics not impacted more strongly? the segment of the protein that's being reported in papers, and why is proteomics not impacted more strongly, since we have the ability now to measure a very large fraction of the protein. So Al's conclusion was um, that new findings are reported predominantly on those proteins that are routinely measurable in many laboratories, that is those for which antibodies are available. So we basically, we divide the we divide the proteomics world into two populations. There's those of us who have um, discovery machines in the laboratory. We are very good at um, identifying thousands of proteins in a sample and writing a paper about it. And these are relatively few laboratories. If you actually do another survey of the literature, the number of laboratories that report these papers is relatively small maybe in the few dozens. And there's, of course, thousands of research laboratories that also study proteins which do not access mass spectrometry, at least not in that sense, and they basically are based on immunoassays. So we would summarize um, this second uh, short part. In contrast to proteome, dis proteome discovery, the use of proteomics in biology, biology and medicine has led, been much less successful. So we have the abilities to discover a lot of proteins, but how this is translated into, into research papers which actually report new biology is not so clear. And this is clearly documented from literature analysis. The proteins for which antibody assays have been available appear in the literatures, the others do not. So most of the pro reported reports that are being uh, showing up in the literature that concern proteins, either single proteins or ensembles of proteins, are carried out by antibody assays, <coughs> Western blot, ELISAs, and so on. So we conclude from that that an important high impact goal for proteomics would be to make every protein reliably measurable via a, through a high quality assay, and then to disseminate these assays. So basically make the equivalent of antibody assays <coughs> but in a, on a on mass spectrometry basis and make them very widely accessible. So that these thousands of research labs that have a research problem focused on proteins would be able to use the very advanced mass spec techniques and, re and generate reliable data. And this would have, I think, a substantial impact on the literature and the field in general. And of course, where I'm heading here is that this is exactly what we try to achieve with targeted mass spectrometry, that we can generate very high quality assays, disseminate them in the, uh, and, and the software tools to actually analyze the data, disseminate these resources really in the community 
and then the number of proteins measurable from Al's uh, graph here, which one could then by implication generate very good quality assays for all these proteins out here. They will become measurable. It's certainly not so that these proteins are less biologically interesting. There simply has been for the average lab no way to actually generate data on these proteins, whereas this would be possible through a targeted MS um, uh, activity. Okay, now I'm <coughs> going to next stage here to describe briefly targeted mass spectrometry in the, in the landscape. So it is, it's probably already quite clear from the discussion where we're heading here and why we think this targeting is so important. So we think targeting mass spectrometry is the ideal technique in, in, many, in, in any one of its impl implementations to use the proteome basically as an entity that as, a, as an entity that is dynamically changing under various conditions and to capture these changes that are occurring. For instance, health or disease, when you knock out the gene, when you overexpress the protein, when you mutate the protein, this all has implications for the proteome and we would like to make this measurable. And for that, we need to be able to measure the proteome or subsegments thereof highly reproducibly and with good quantitative accuracy. And this is what targeting can provide. So we see the, the proteomic landscape basically like in this very old paper in kind of two domains. The one is discovery effort, where we use the shotgun or discovery methods to really come to saturation. And then the 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 the, the reanalysis of the proteome, where we would use targeting methods. Eventually, as we'll probably see towards the end, these two might converge again, but right now I think it's a reasonable representation of the situation. So targeting is now increasingly recognized as useful and, uh, and with high potential. So in, I don't remember what year, maybe 12, the journal Nature methods declared targeted proteomics as methods of the year. They always do this. They select one method that comes up during uh, and, and, and make it at the end of the year as the method of the year. They chose, fortunately, for I think for the proteomics field, targeted proteomics as this method in 2012. And so here now I, I indicate the principles of targeted analysis and don't go in any details how we measure, how we set up the instrument. This is all coming through um, then the rest of the week. I just want to make some principal comments. So we would, we would, I think one one easy way to extrapolate from what everyone is doing in the laboratory is to say, right now proteins in most laboratories are measured by immunoassays. Let's say Western blotter relies us, and I think one easy way to conceptually to explain targeted mass spectrometry is to say we're trying to do exactly the same but using a mass spectrometer. So we generate a highly specific mass spectrometric assay for each targeted peptide, and the wet lab ana analogy would be to generate an antibody. And then one, once one has this assay, and in, in, you will see how these assays are built, and how they are verified and validated, it is actually much orders of magnitude less, less str uh, stressful and less involved than generating an antibody. Once one has such an assay, we can use this mass spectrometric assay to detect and quantify the targeted peptide in a sample, in a mass spectrometer, and the analogy would be to do some kind of Western blot to realize a test. So in essence, we're talking about the mass spectrometric equivalent to highly multiplexed ELISA or Western plotting, and it requires that prior data or maps are being used, and one of the topics you will learn is how to generate a high quality assay for, for a specific peptide that truly represents a protein. Incidentally, I should say, I started out by explaining this proteolytic background problem. This proteolytic background problem, to a large extent, goes away. Because we don't need to, we don't need to a priori, uh, this, uh, consider all the unnecessary or unwanted or unexpected peptides. We can just focus on those peptides which truly represent the protein we want to target. And we would typically choose maybe three peptides per protein, although this is open for, of course, um, a change. I mean, people can use as many as they want. But we do, we have the option to a priori focus on those peptides which are the most informative, and then develop assays for those, and these assays are highly reproducible and highly informative. 
Mm -hmm. The principal difference in peptide identification between shotgun measurement would be that and, and targeting would be in, <coughs> basically in, in DDA or shotgun mass spectrometer, we generate a very large number of spectra, thousands or tens of thousands per hour, and then we determine the best match between the spectrum and the database. <coughs> and then we need to determine whether this best match is also a true match. So this is, uh, we basically start with a pep, with a peptide spectrum and try to work our way back. In targeting MS is more of a hypothesis testing uh, experiment. We say we know exactly what we look for. We know the identity of the peptide we target. We know how this peptide looks to mass spectrometer. We know what its mass, we know its fragmentine spectrum, we know its solution time in a, in a chromatography system. And we basically test a hypothesis whether the mass spectrometer from a particular sample generates a set of signals that correspond uniquely with the targeted peptide. So it's a fundamentally different way of analyzing the data and it has implications for the software tools as you'll see and also for the statistical analysis of the obtained results. There's several implementations, technical implementations of this um, targeting mass spectrometry right now. The one we spend most of the time on in the course is selected and multiple reaction monitoring, which is done in triple quadrupole instruments. More recently, there's data methods have been developed, which are referred to as data independent acquisition methods. One of them is SWOTMS, which generates, um, which basically is a combination of data independent acquisition, where everything is fragmented as in a sample, and targeted data analysis in silico. We basically do exactly the same analysis data analysis as in SRM or MRM, but do it in silico after data have been acquired. And then there is a, a technique that was uh, proposed and, uh, and is practiced quite widely by, uh, particularly by Dick Smith and his group, is the issue, this technique of accurate mass and time tags, which in some way is a targeting method, but it does not actually operate at the level of fragment ions, it just operates at the level of the precursor mass and it makes it somewhat vulnerable to false positive identifications. So these two methods are uh, operate at the level of fragment ion spectra, are highly reliable and you will f find out how they work. So if we, if we don't, if I don't go into detail <coughs> how they work and how data have been generated and analyzed, don't worry about it. I just want to see, show that there's several implementations and here also there's now high resolution instruments that generate exactly the same type of data, and this is referred to as PRM. Okay, so I think to summarize this part, I would say that we have different objectives between data-dependent analysis of shotgun and targeting. If you want to identify a lot of proteins, basically have limited number of conditions and like to have maximal number of proteins identified, we would use a discovery method. If we have many conditions and we would like to consistently have a matrix of proteins measured in every condition, and if this number of conditions is dozens or hundreds, then we think currently that the targeting methods are um, the way to go. So summary three, targeted mass spectrometry is the MS analog to Western plotting, although with a much better performance. It can be much more highly multiplexed. Uh, it interfaces directly with many common common bio biological research strategies where someone has a hypothesis and says how does a particular protein or set of proteins behave under a number of conditions. And for every protein a measurement assay is required, which has to be done before. The wet lab equivalent would be to raise an antibody. It is much more straightforward to generate targeting MS assays. We'll see this later in the course. And there's several implementations of this, of this strategy and the details will be be discussed also later. So we think, coming back to Al Edwards' graph, we certainly assume and think that if the broad implementation of targeting mass spectrometry might finally change the landscape of which proteins are studied by biologists and much significantly broaden that landscape. Okay, now I would like to... Um, maybe I'm going to run out of time, so maybe I'll only do one. We'll see. We'll show uh, with two um, applications or two studies that are ongoing in our lab how targeted mass spectrometry can be used to support either somewhat conventional research strategy or 
conventional research question and to support maybe strategies which have not been addressed before by cryptomics. So the first one, I, I summarize with the statement, more information is better. And um, what I mean with that is I'll try to demonstrate that the chromatographic retention time profile of targeting MS resolves ambiguous phosphorylation site assignments. So um, let me first state the problem. Phos protein phosphorylation analysis is, um, of course, a very prominent field or subfield of proteomics. There's a huge amount of interest <coughs> in identifying phosphopeptides. And we see this here from a graph that was published from a paper <coughs> by Albert Peck that the number of peptides, phosphopeptides identified has gone up a lot. This is now somewhat outdated. I should probably look for a better, a newer review, not a better one, a newer review. And the number of phosphopeptides identified are now in the range of, of, of a few 10,000 per study. So this is remarkable. But it has, it has some, it has, there's, there's again, some extremely challenging questions. <coughs> and one of these questions is, which ones of these phosphopeptides are actually the correct phosphopeptides. So I think we can be fairly sure that the peptide backbone sequence for most of these peptides is quite correctly identified because the tools that we have available for peptide sequence analysis using, using spectra, um, fragmentized spectra, is actually quite robust. The problem comes from where this particular phosphopeptide is actually phosphorylated. So of course, if you have only one hydroxyl amino acid, like one serine or threonine, the peptide is clear. If you measure a phosphopeptide that has only one hydroxyl amino acid, you, you're, you're on safe ground. But what if the peptide has two or three or five or 10 hydroxyl amino acids? You need, on, you need to determine the amino acid backbone sequence, and you need to say which one of these sites is actually phosphorylated. And as I will show, this is a substantial source of error. So there's been enormous increase in number of phosphopeptides analyzed. We think that the backbones are fairly correctly identified. And we think that in spite of fairly sophisticated tools, the assignment of a peptide, of a, of a phosphorylation site to a peptide backbone is still extremely challenging. So, why do I say more information is better? Because in targeting, this is, a, this is basically the output that a targeting experiment provides. We have a retention time dimension. We have a intensity dimension. And each one of these curves is the fragment ion, a, a trace, a chromatographic trace of one fragment ion from a specific peptide that we want to target. So the ensemble of these peptide uh, fragment ion traces form a peak group, and the ensemble of these peak groups, of, this, of the peaks in this peak group, together uh, lead us to identify a peptide. So we don't have just a snapshot of a signal. We have a continuous um, sampling of the same signals, usually 8 to 10 times over the chromatographic illusion time of the peak. We can reconstruct for each fragment ion trace a peak, and the ensemble of this information here tells us whether we have a peptide correctly identified or not in targeting mass spectrometry. So the additional information we have available, which we do not have available in shotgun proteomics, is the chromatographic course, basically the peak shape, the peak um, distribution, the peak width, basically the, the chromatographic, the time dimension of a, the traces that associate with a peptide. So now show that this, um, the, the added information obtained by this chromatographic dimension has sub substantial implications for this phosphopeptide site assignment issue. So here is an experiment that um, a, a postdoc in the laboratory did. Typical data dependent, uh, this is Alessio uh, Maiolica, who was postdoc uh, in, in our group, is now left. But he did a typical data-dependent phosphoanalysis study. He took cells that, which are in me different mitotic states. It's not really important, but he basically has a number of samples, and he tried to figure out how is the phosphoproteome landscape changing. 
it took each one of these samples, he isolated phosphopeptides using the classical um, phosphopeptide enrichment <coughs> method, which is not important here. And then he search generated DDA, shotgun data. He searched with search engines, commonly used search engines. He integrated the data from various search engines with a tool called Interprofit. And then he used a tool to assign to these peptides, which based on some uh, probability measures, which phosphorylation site was identified, which, which site was phosphorylated in this peptide. So this is a typical workflow. This is a typical type of results. Um, he has, had, has about lots of spectra acquired, um, a, a lot of phosphopeptides identified. Okay, so now when we plot, so because he wanted to do this throughout the cell cycle, he had multiple samples. And now we plot here, so he assumes that he has close to 20,000 phosphopeptides identified cumulatively. So now we plot here for each, for each cell cycle time point, how many phosphopeptides he identifies and somewhere between four to 6,000 per sample. And when he accumulates all this data in, in, in one, uh, in one ensemble or co combined data set, we see that whenever, the more you sequence, the more you identify. So this is, this is a dangerous curve because you, and, and we've seen that already in, in, um, by, in, in studies where we accumulated large amounts of um, shotgun data to identify as many proteins as possible. Whenever you have a curve like that, the more data you add, the more you identify, you should start to get worried. Because eventually, you should have discovered most that's to be discovered. You will see a curve going up here, cumulative curve, and eventually flatten out. But this is not flat out, so this, this raised our suspicion that some of these might be wrong identification, mostly probably from the side to side. We then asked, um, if we analyze the number of peptides, backbone peptides are identified, these are the red, uh, the red bars here, we see that um, there's also a number of red, uh, quite a high number of, of <coughs> backbone peptides identified. And we ask how do they accumulate? And they accumulate, uh, if you control the error rate, in a way you would kind of expect they go up, and then they kind of flatten out. So we have a situation here that the, back, the number of backbone, backbone pep, phosphopeptides we identify is roughly flattening out the more data we add. So we basically say we have probably, with this type of measurement, discovered most of the phosphopeptide backbones that are to be discovered, whereas the phosphopeptide identifications still, still keep creeping up. And we assume that this, well, this delta is very large, uh, several thousand, and we assume that many of those are wrong assignments because of the search engine that assigns the phosphorylation site to the backbone sequence will make mistakes. So that's the, our hypothesis that we now pursue. So how can targeting help? This is actually data from Tina Ludwig, who we'll talk about also in this course. And here I illustrate the problem. So we can use the ion chromatograms to resolve phosphopeptide ambiguity. So here we have a peptide um, that is um, peptide sequence here. You see that uh, these peptides have shared amino acid sequence in the, in the peptide, and, we, and they have different phosphorylation sites that are being phosphorylated. So we have serine 70, 72, 75. This is not actually uncommon that you have a string of phosphorylation sites that are um, present in the same peptides and could potentially be phosphorylated. It doesn't, of course, mean that they are phosphorylated, but it could be that they are. <coughs> so here are the uh, B and Y ions that would be expected from these peptides if these peptides were fragmented in a mass spectrometer. The red ones would be B and Y ions are shared that are not allowing us to distinguish between the phosphorylation sites in this peptide. And the green ones would allow us to distinguish. So you see immediately that there's much more red than green. That means that the, the mass, that it's an extremely challenging task for a software tool to make an assignment of which precise phosphorylation site, 70, 72, or 75, is actually phosphorylated if the only thing we have available is the fragment ion spectra. Because it may well be that these, that these B and Y ions are not actually discovered, or they are obscured, or they're not particularly pronounced. 
So why? So so Tina then synthesized these peptides in the various phosphorylated forms and run them through a targeting mass spectrometry, um, the triple quadrupole instrument. And we see here that the typical peak group for the phosphopeptide phosphorylated at serine 70, phosphorylated at 72, and phosphorylated at 75. So this is not super remarkable. You can say, well, we have simply nice peak groups and we can, we can see uh, fragment ions over chromatographic retention time, which um, clearly are associated with this peptide. But how about, but what if these green ones are actually not showing up here and not able to distinguish the peptides? That's where this chromatographic separation comes in. What, what she showed here is that we can use the chromatography, the retention time, to distinguish these peptides. So even though we may have difficulty finding the, the signals for these green transitions or fragment ions which distinguish the three phosphorylation sites, um, we will be able to separate these peptides chromatographically and say clearly if this serine 72 is phosphorylated, the peptide eludes here. If 70 is phosphorylated, the peptide eludes here. And 75 is phosphorylated, the peptide eludes here. So that's what I mean with added information, uh, the chromatographic dimension helping us to, um, to distinguish between phosphorylation sites. And this is very nicely done by targeting because we actually do have we actually do record the chromatographic re uh, retention time and resolution in the multiple peaks. Okay, so now we will come back to this um, example here. I showed before that we were able to generate <coughs> intensely a large number of identifications, but we have these two diverging curves of backbone peptides and phosphorylation sites which made us nervous. So then Alessio and Ludovic Schie, who actually also will be here later in the week, they did a, a large-scale targeting experiment. The details are not really that important. But they basically generated a, a large library of, um, of phosphopeptides, so basically a, a large assay library of phosphopeptides from these cells, and did a large-scale targeting experiment to identify uh, phosphopeptides and distinguish various <laughs> phosphopeptides not only by the fragment ion spectrum, but also in by also by the chromatographic retention time. I'm basically asking if you have a if we have a peptide of a particular backbone that has multiple phosphorylation sites, does this peptide generally split up in more than one peak, or are all these phosphorylation sites in one peak? Then you would say it's probably only one site. If there's two peaks or three peaks or five peaks, you would say there's different sites that are being phosphorylated. Okay, so how exactly this was done, I'm not talking about because this will come later, but this is where we ended up uh, before. We have this curve of backbone peptides. We have a curve of phosphorylation peptides identified by, in, by DDA, shotgun mass spectrometry, using currently the most, the most advanced tools. And this is the phosphopeptides that were identified by targeting. We see, first of all, that e per sample, we identify a, a significantly large, larger number of phosphopeptides than, than the DDA method alone. And this is the curve that the phosphopeptides infers, a uh, phosphopeptide uh, shows that, that of, the, of the number of phosphopeptides analyzed by targeting large-scale targeting mass spectrometry. And we see that this curve now not very nicely follows in, in its, in its uh, in, it very nicely follows the curve of the identified backbone sequences. So what we conclude from that, although this is not formal proof, because we have not, of course, been able to uh, verify each one of these identifications, but these curves are very telling. Basically what these curves tell us, that if we use targeting and therefore the additional information of the chromatographic resolution of differentially phosphorylated peptides, um, that are detectable by chromatography, we obtain a curve, uh, an accumulation curve, that follows very nicely the number of identified phosphopeptide backbones. And since we are very, very confident now with, uh, through software tools that we do not accumulate a lot of false positive backbone sequences, we assume that we also do not accumulate a very large number of false side assignments using the added information of the, of the Photography, and we assume that this creep here at the curve keeps going up. This delta here is largely due 
for false positive side assignments, not necessarily false positive backbone assignments. So this is an example that I try to show here that more information is better. Targeting mass spectrometry provides additional information, um, not just for phosphorylation, but in general, it has additional uh, data um, dimension that is the chromatographic uh, resolution of the peak, which is also, for instance, extremely useful for, for quantification. And the added information of chromatographic peak print construction increases quantitative accuracy and provides a, additional data dimension specifically for the reduction of error rates in PTM analysis. Okay, now, um, Edward, should I stop here or should I go so for it? It's exactly 10 to... So, you can extend five more minutes? So okay, far? that's fine. I, I think okay. <coughs> so this was an example where I showed that with the added information obtained from the chromatographic resolution and the fact that we measure each peptide multiple times in, in targeting, we can obtain um, high quality data which helps us to um, in, in, in fairly conventional workflows. And I would like to show an example where we can attempt to do e experiments which certainly for proteomics have been difficult to accomplish in the past. So I, co I, I come back to this um, graph or this article here this an article was published a while back um, in 07, and it said it's the, in, in biology we're entering the end of theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. I found this an intriguing article because it basically says that when we were trained as biologists, as scientists in general, we are trained to use the hypothesis-driven method, which basically means we synthesize in our brain a, a certain amount of information and we form a model. And out of this model, we formulate a hypothesis that we then test. And testing basically means we try to generate data to reject this hypothesis. And this is how we have been basically uh, trained <coughs> to operate on, on some model that synthesizes prior information. And what this author says, um, that faced with massive, data, massive amount of data, this approach to science hypo hypo hypothesized model test is becoming obsolete. So what he says is basically Google will take over. All we need is huge amounts of data, petabytes of data, and then use correlation. So rather than building a model, we would, we would generate a huge amount of data, collect massive amount of data, and then use statistical correlations to basically uh, come up with new insights. This is actually a very interesting uh, hypothesis, and we discuss this a lot in the lab. And Olga Vitek who will be here discuss this a lot with Olga, and she actually doesn't believe this is true, uh, but, but nevertheless, I think it's an interesting contention. And it clearly is the basis of a lot of genomic information, the genomic studies, that when you have huge amounts of data being accumulated in some context, that then through correlation one tries to f make new findings. So now I would like to, s to say or argue that we would be able to use the same kind of thinking in some context in proteomics. So this is a, a slide that, I, that we use, uh, certainly I use, to kind of formula, formalize or, or schematize where we like to go. We have enormous richness of genotypic information. It's thousands and hundreds of thousands soon of whole genomes are being sequenced. And they <coughs> uncover a huge amount of genomic variability. And one tries to relate this genotypic variability to phenotypic variability, so that each individual is different. And of course, we can say we can we sequence here cancer genomes, and then we would like to distinguish who has cancer and who does not, or who is predisposed from cancer, and so on. In reality, it's been very difficult to go from genotype directly to phenotype. And what we postulate here is that an in, as an intermediate level, we would use what we refer to as proteotypes, basically an acute instance of a proteome in a cell or in a tissue, that this is related, that this genotypic variation determines the proteotype, how, which proteins are present at what levels, and how they are connected, basically the state of the proteome at any given cell, and that it is, it is this state of the proteome at any given time that determines the phenotype, and not, of course, the genotype. Because this proteome, <coughs> is essentially 
the entity that carries out essentially all biochemical functions. So if, if we believe in something like that, then we would say if we could measure this prototype precisely and quickly over many, many conditions, like cancer genomics tries to do with hundreds or now thousands of cancer patients, we would probably have a entity, a data set, that is highly reproducible and quantitative, that is closer to the biochemical source of, of phenotypic variation. So that's the assumption. So here I show very quickly a few exa an example of such a study uh, where we try to test this principle. The experimental design is require targeting mass spectrometry data from the NCI 60 cell compendium. I'll say what this is in a minute. And then we correlate these proteotypes, so the protein measurements, with phenotypes measured on these same cells, which is drug sensitivity or drug resistance. Okay, so what are NCI60 cells? These are 60 cell lines that are derived from multiple, multiple organs. NCI stands for National Cancer Institute, 60 stands for 60 cell lines. And these cell lines have been exceedingly well characterized and maintained by the National Cancer Institute in the US. So we can order aliquots of these cells from them, and, and they are delivered to us. So um, a postdoc, Tianan Guo, has ordered these cells, they're derived from various tissues, and then he has generated targeting mass spectrometry data sets from these cell lines. How we exactly did this is not important here, but what, what is important that these cell lines have been very extensively characterized before, on the genomic level, and more importantly for our discussion here, in response to drug, <coughs> drug sensitivities. This was done by the Broad Institute. They used 100,000 compounds and tested them against each one of the cells to determine whether these cells respond to a drug or are resistant to a drug or whether the drug has no effect. So this is a very broad uh, phenotypic readout. We have, and then we generated, uh, or Tianan generated this proteomic data, which is basically 120 uh, targeting mass spectrometry data sets, each cell measured twice, and this would be the number of proteins, which is about, which is about 4,000. So he measured about 4,000 proteins by targeting mass spectrometry in each one of the cells in duplicate. So this is the data set, it's fairly complete. So what can we do? Now we can start to do correlations. We can, class it, we can use this, this, uh, this data here, which is basically a description of the proteome, of course not the whole proteome, we expect that each cell uh, expresses roughly 10,000 proteins. We, we, we capture less than half, but nevertheless it's a large, it's a large, a sizable fraction of the proteome. Now we can do classification, and we can ask, it, by ma making no assumptions, can the protein data reconstruct the tissue origin of this, um, of this cell? <coughs> so this is not um, super interesting, but it is actually remarkable how well it works and what we learn. So there are some cell lines which are melanoma. They are very close together and they clearly form a group here that is, um, is very tight. Same for renal cancer, whereas we see here leukemia cells are not the same, so they, they have very different uh, origins or very different proteins. So even from this very simple analysis, we see that there is actually a lot of information in this, in this proteomic data sets. We then try to infer or group these tissue types together. So basically, we take now all these proteomes, which are quantitative descriptions of about 4,000 proteins, and we try to relate this to um, basically to unsupervised analysis and group those patterns together, which are closer together, and those who are far apart from each other they are further apart, apart of this tree. So a tree is generated, so this is similar to a phylogenetic tree, except we use, we use molecular data to distinguish or, or group the protein patterns into each other. So these are not individual <coughs> proteins, but protein patterns. And what we see here is color-coded. We see groups of uh, appearing here, and this group, for instance, is very close together. So each, each dot represents a cell line, the distance between the groups represents the distance in the proteomes measured from the cell lines. So we see some groups here, I think this is colon cancer cells, are fairly close together. And generally these cells, and the, the white ones here, and, and these guys here, are fairly close together if they come from the same tissue. But that's not true from the, for, for all tissues. So for instance, breast cancer, which is 
uh, this one here, we see that there are some breast cancer cell lines that are, that are clustered here in this tree graph and some are clustered <laughs> over here in this tree graph. So we, we would assume simply from this data that even though for our pathologies or for the annotation, these cells are derived from the same tissue, they will have different origin or something else is substantially different to make them group far apart in this tree. The other, the other cancer type which, where this happens is lung cancer. Again, we have several group, we have several, this is, this is lung cancer, I think, this is lung cancer. So again, we have several cell sources that look substantially different, even though they are ostensibly coming from the same tissue. Now we'd like to associate these drawdown patterns with the phenotype drug resistance or drug response. So this is, of course, a huge amount of data because we can now do this for basically every one of these 100,000 drugs. But this is one example of those just for illustration purposes. So what we see here again is cell lines. Green means um, uh, responsive to the drug. Red means resistant to the drug. And the color coding means the degree of resistance. So the, these guys will be less <laughs> resistant than these guys because they're more red. But what's important is that we have now 60 cell lines <coughs> based on the proteome measure. So this is a molecular readout. We have the phenotypic readout, are these cells responsive or, um, uh, or, or resistant to the drug? And we can do a correlation analysis and be a build a tree, depending on, their, on the correlation between the phenotype and the molecular kind of makeup of the cell. And we see, interestingly, that for this drug, drug, which is a MEK inhibitor, three clusters of resistance emerge. So we're not only saying these proteins, these cells are resistant, we clearly have evidence that, these, that there's three mechanisms how this resistance arises, because these cells, these cells, and these cells have substantially different protein patterns, although they all have the same phenotype. Now, since we know the protein patterns in each one of these clusters, we can align them and ask, which proteins are different in these clusters that mediate this resistance. And so this is an alignment of, of these clusters, cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, from the, from the previous graph here. So this would be cluster one, cluster two, cluster three. And we see, and each, each block here is a specific protein, and the color code indicates the abundance of this protein in this respective cell. So we clearly see that cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three have protein, contain proteins which are different for the various clusters. And that we can that we can find now, we can reduce the drug resistance phenotype into clusters of cells that behave in the same way by correlation analysis. And since we know these proteins, we can go back and, and say these are the proteins which have the most highest weight in mediating this resistance or or response to these, uh, to these particular drugs. And so these are the proteins that come out. We have protein kinases, membrane transporters, transporters, um, uh, other transporters. We have um, me pro proteins, me metabolic proteins, which possibly um, metabolize these, uh, some of these uh, drugs or its, met its metabolic uh, intermediates. So I don't have time to really uh, get in deep into that. They only the only point I want to make is we have the ability to correlate, since we now can, can be targeting mass spectrometry measure, large numbers of samples, large numbers of samples that we, that we put before in, in proteomics. At a high degree of reproducibility, we can use the power of statistical correlation. And then since we know the proteins which actually make the difference, we can then learn something mechanistic because these proteins obviously are close to the biochemistry. And this worked actually very beautifully here for this particular um, kinase inhibitor, and it works for many other drugs. To summarize, summary five here, highly reproducible measurements of high numbers of prototypes supports research strategies based on the big data correlation. <coughs> the highly reproducible prototype patterns of this NCI60 cell compendium led uh, us to classify the cell or tissue type, um, indicate drug resistance and sensitivity, and we find proteins, clusters, of drug sensitivity that they are different by chemical. So now, one comment about the future. What we think, I, I, I made already comments very early on about the uptake of proteomics <coughs> in the general community, and I think targeting proteomics has 
enormous potential to facilitate the uptake. So what we envisage, and, uh, and also I think Mike McCulson and Brenton will talk about uh, their vision and their implementation actually of these general ideas, that we make public as a community spectral libraries representing whole proteomes. This to some extent has already happened. For instance, Olga Schubert, <coughs> who is here, has generated such a library, very high quality <coughs> library, for MTB, microbacterium tuberculosis. And this is publicly accessible, so we can say that every person, uh, every scientist who is interested in any protein, to measure any protein MTB, can go there and basically download the assays to measure this protein. And so it's, it is like if you have a freezer in the laboratory with an antibody for every conceivable MTB protein. And so it makes the proteome of the species measurable and other species have also been are on the way of being uh, reaching that level, uh, but there's still very few. But we think this is one important component. Then we would acquire, we would, we would also envisage that large-scale targeting data sets would be acquired and put, for instance, in the cloud, so that a researcher who does not necessarily have a mass spectrometer in the laboratory and who is basically sitting on their desktop, they could use these assets to mine this data here and to, to test hypotheses to make queries across prototype patterns and to basically mine a digital biobank that represents the in digital form biological samples that have been acquired by someone somewhere in the world but are accessible for research. So um, this is where I think or hope things will go. There is an organization called HUPO, um, which has a project which is called the Human Project, Human Proteome Project. And for some reason, which I don't want to explain, it's called the BD Human Pro Biology or Disease Driven Human Proteome Project. And the idea here is exactly to do what I just showed in this vision slide, that communities would form around a biological or clinical question. And the, the specialists of that, the bio, biology specialists of that domain, would specify which proteins are important for their research. And then the UPO project would deliver uh, highly specific assays for all these proteins, so that within this respective communities, cancer could be cardiovascular disease, could be diabetes, could be uh, neurodegenerative disease. They all have proteins which really matter to them, and many of them are not measurable. And basically, this program would like to make all these proteins reproducibly measurable. And for those of you who go to HUPO next week, this is next week in Madrid, I would encourage you to actively participate in these discussions because I think this is a, a, it's a nice idea but it needs some um, momentum and of course support from people who actually do the work. So with that I will thank you for your attention and wish you an interesting course.